use as a resource afterwards and will be available on the um, website for the West Midlands Teaching Partnership. So I'd like to say hello, my name's Sarah Brain and I'm one of three consultant social workers working for the West Midlands Social Work Teaching Partnership. Welcome to Practice Week, this is a third session um, so far today and it's um, a session on the Social Work Apprenticeship by Megan Smith from Staffordshire University. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of information about the West Midlands Teaching Partnership, just for those of you out there who may not know about, about what, we, what we are and what we do. So we are one of 23 accredited teaching partnerships in England, and there are 28 partners in the partnership in total, um, local authorities, um, higher education institutes, universities, children's trusts, NHS trusts make up a teaching partnership. And the aim is to bring practitioners, senior managers, academics, researchers and experts by experience together to support us in our work, which is to improve social work education and practice. Um, as Adam said, if you can keep, I think he said, if you can keep yourselves on mute and turn your cameras off and please do use the chat function if you've got any questions to ask Megan, which um, I'm sure she'll make time to answer throughout the session and at the end. Um, and I hope, I hope you all enjoy the session today. At the end, I will um, come back on just to close things off as well. Thank you. Real. Okay, let me pull the presentation up. Um, okay, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Megan Smith. Um, I'm the work based education officer um, on the social work apprenticeship at Staffordshire University. Um, so my role is mainly supporting the apprentices on their journeys to becoming qualified social workers and I'm lucky to have four of our brilliant apprentices with me today who will introduce themselves as they go through their sections. Um, they've kindly volunteered to share their personal journeys and reflections over the past 12 months with you today um, in relation to practice and starting the apprenticeship during these strange times. So the plan for this session will look a little bit like this. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of the apprenticeship generally, um, how it's different to the BA, some of the challenges we face as a university and how we've overcome these over the past 12 months. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to our level four apprentices who are going to take you through their journeys, their experiences and hopefully give you some insight into areas that have worked well during these times. Um, and then we'll cover questions that pop up in the chat that I can't kind of tackle as we're going through if we've got time at the end. Um, so the apprenticeship, where did it start? Um, so all of our apprentices have come from different health and social care backgrounds, as well as different educational levels, and they bring a wealth of practical experience with them, which is invaluable during lectures and group work. Um, so whilst your apprenticeships generally require you to have a minimum of level two maths and English and um, there are some apprentices that might have previous degree experience and others who haven't studied since they left school so it's important that we ensure that the learning is suitable for everyone in the first year of the course to kind of get a bit of a baseline level. Um, so our apprentices um, go through a, a comprehensive recruitment process so this takes place in conjunction with the university and our local um, partners um, to ensure the individuals coming onto the course are aware of the expectations of the apprenticeship and the commitment that they're taking on as part of completing a degree alongside their current roles. So we do a mixture of um, some recruitment events. So um, the university holds recruitment events and explain all about the course, um, the expectations of the course, the, how the kind of it's structured, the topics you'll cover, um, and the employers are present during those events. Um, and then they, the apprentices or the candidates will submit an expression of interest to their employer. So they'll, if they want to come on the course, they submit a written expression of interest and then our partners will complete a shortlisting process. Um, and then following that, there's an interview process. So it's quite a, a comprehensive um, process that the individuals have to go through in order to get onto the course. But that's to ensure that kind of that level of understanding is there of the commitment that they're taking on and the right people are on the course. Um, 
So as you can imagine, it's not an easy task taking on a degree alongside full time working. Um, so it, that's why that kind of process is so important. Um, so all our apprentices will leave the course with um, the same qualification as the BA students, um, as well as they obviously have the opportunity to gain knowledge, skills and behaviours through their learning on the job. Um, so five days kind of across the week, one day is at university um, and then the other four days they're doing learning in practice. So applying what they've learned on their university day in practice and also kind of seeking additional opportunities to enhance their knowledge, skills and behaviours. Um, so as part of the apprenticeship and generally across all apprenticeships, they're required to complete a minimum of their their working week is off the job learning. So their university day accounts for, for that 20%, but then additional learning is required outside of, of that day as well. Um, and they're assessed using similar assessment methods to the BA students. Um, however, they have to pass an endpoint assessment as part of the apprenticeship. Um, so, so far we've got two cohorts of apprentices, so our first cohort started in January 2020 and there's 29 apprentices in that group um, and then we've had 30 apprentices who started with us in January 2021, so we're starting to think about recruitment for next year which is very exciting. So we've got a good group of apprentices at the moment and um, but like I say we've got four of them with us today to share their experiences. So. The pandemic. <laughs> um, as a result of the pandemic, we were faced with some challenges to the delivery of the course. Um, so our first cohort of apprentices were faced with potentially having their learning paused um, only three months into the course as a result of the pressures in their roles in practice. Um, so they were required to continue working in practice, but as you'll hear from some of our apprentices who are here today, Practice looked very different during these times, so therefore managing the two, the, their studies and work, obviously had new challenges. Um, and then our level four apprentices who've been working throughout the whole pandemic um, have joined the apprenticeship during all amongst this. So um, they've still committed to joining and starting their journey to become social workers. Um, so they were faced with attending and completing the recruitment process in a remote setting. So the events were held virtually, their interviews were held virtually, and even their inductions and start in the course was all remote. Um, we had planned to return to campus in January 2021. However, obviously the lockdown was extended after Christmas. So their first university session and the majority of the first module took place via Teams, which wasn't how we'd initially planned. Um, so, there was also some unique challenges within each individual teams um, which led to the apprentices having additional responsibilities and job role changes and increased work pressures so there's a lot that our apprentices have had to adapt to not just from an academic side but also from a a, a practice side um, so whilst everybody's been adjusting individually to their kind of individual roles and responsibilities our apprentices have been faced with having to tackle it from both sides which is a huge challenge however what's worked well so our apprentices are the only well the social work apprenticeship is the only health and social care apprenticeship at SAFS uni that continued during the pandemic so other health and social care apprenticeships went on a break in learning and they're now faced with completing their course later than their original planned end date or they, some of them haven't been able to continue at all due to work pressures. Um, however, our level five apprentices who were faced with that at the time, they chose to continue with their learning rather than go on a break in learning and they carried on working throughout the, the pandemic and were supported by their employer and obviously supported by the university with that decision. Um, so they've avoided that delay in their qualification and they've also gained a huge amount of additional experience that they can reflect on as part of their journey to become social workers. Um, so as a result of that, we've we've made changes to the module delivery in order to support remote learning. So we swapped some modules around which were better suited to remote platforms with a view that hopefully we'd be back on campus um, for the, the module following um, and try and take the pressure off the apprentices a little bit. Um, so we continued to deliver lectures via Teams and regularly collected and reviewed feedback to ensure that the experiences met the expectations of our apprentices um, whilst we were delivering teaching remotely. So we adapted 
um, some group work breakout rooms and try to kind of get that interaction involved in, in the remote settings, which is quite, quite difficult when um, you've got a group of apprentices who are so used to being people, pe you know, people um, facing and engaging, and then all of a sudden sat behind a screen, it's quite challenging to kind of incorporate that into sessions, but we've, we've taken on that feedback and adapted sessions to include that. Um, we continue to have our service user and carer group involved in our sessions and assessments, so they carried on completing role plays and sharing their lived experiences with our apprenticeship our apprentices, which is hugely valuable to their, um, their learning and skills practices continued. So our apprentices still continue to complete six shadowing days over the summer um, and they are now our first cohort are on their first 70 day placement um, as we speak, which is um, huge, you know, to be going on placement during during the pandemic is massive. So we've managed to keep their skill sessions going, which is brill. Um, and then our apprentices who joined the course in January 2021 were still able to interview, enrol and start the course during lockdown, although not in the way we'd expected, but we still managed to complete, you know, that, that process. Um, so there's been no delay to people starting the course um, and we've not had to kind of push that time frame back, which is really good. Um, our apprentices have set up some remote support groups on virtual platforms to build relationships and discuss the course. Um, so they've all been in regular contact with one another and have fed back that peer support on the course that they felt has been um, really valuable to their experience. Um, they all met and prepared presentations with individuals that they had never met before. Um, and then when they came onto campus, they were able to deliver these in person. Um, and in fact, the day that they delivered them was the first day they'd ever met each other. So the fact that they've adapted and kind of embraced that challenge is huge. And the standard was absolutely brilliant. Um, and, you know, academic staff and support services have been a key focus for us to ensure that our apprentices don't feel isolated um, and kind of or overwhelmed and make sure that support is there. So progress reviews have continued throughout with both cohorts and the academic mentoring sessions are still available virtually, as is study skills support um, and other services through the university. Um, so that's a brief overview of how the apprenticeship has worked over the past 12 months. So I'm going to hand over to Sue, who is going to start with her reflection and her personal journey as part of joining the apprenticeship. Um, so over to you, Sue. Thank, Thank you, you, Megan. OK, so. Um, let me just click through. Brilliant. OK, well, thank you, everybody, for having me here to talk to you today. I'm Sue Oliver and I am a senior family support worker on the wraparound team, which is part of Staffordshire. So I'm from Staffordshire County Council. Um, yeah, and I work within um, fostering services. So I, our team is all about placement stability and trying to maintain placement. Um, if they need a sort of a, a bit of extra support and I support children and young people and also foster carers um, so that's a bit about me and my background but also sort of leads into why I was eligible to be able to apply for the social work apprenticeship so um, so the opportunity came to apply um, in the summer yeah last year so we were we were in the pandemic um, and I'd already applied the previous year and hadn't been successful um, I hadn't even been shortlisted and before that I had applied for the step up to social work um, uh, qualification and hadn't even got through to the assessment centre so again wasn't shortlisted so I did wonder if this was meant to be was I, I, was I meant to be a social worker um, should I apply should I apply during a pandemic um, was it the right time but um, I thought, do you know what? I'm going to do it. Third time lucky. Let's see where this goes. So, um, so I did actually apply, and um, yeah. So, um, so the application process was um, we had to kind of fill our application form was all about sort of drawing upon experiences and talking about how they meet the um, 
um, Basworth PCF's professional capability frameworks um, at the point of entry level. So lots of the questions were sort of geared up around that um, and that was part of the application form. So I submitted the application form and was absolutely shocked and surprised and thrilled and I was shortlisted. Woohoo! So, um, so I was really, really chuffed and, um, and then had to get ready for a three part interview process, which was, uh, yeah, very, very challenging and, um, and it was all completely virtual. Um, so we had to do, uh, it's a part of that three, three part process, we had to do a video for a panel of young people. Um, it was a three minute video and we had to answer the question, um, how would you engage a young person that doesn't want to engage with you? Um, so that was brilliant. That was a challenge in itself, actually just um, doing the video, keeping it to three minutes and then finding a way of sending the video. Um, so condensing the file and sending it over for it to be viewed um, and then know that a panel of young people would be would be viewing that. And um, and then the next part of that process was a 30 minute um, assessed written exercise. Um, so yeah, it was timed. We all did it at the same time and we um, yeah, we, we, we were watched whilst we were doing it and it was a um, safeguarding question and it was around um, a, a foster carer and a young person and a disclosure. So, um, so I felt really confident with that because it was sort of like my area, so to speak, and it's something that sort of happens in practice and, and then so therefore sort of know the procedure to follow. So I kind of came away from that quite confident. And then it was the formal interview and um, that was really scary. So that was a panel of three people and it was um, somebody from uh, the Stafford University um, some and then two people from Staffordshire County Council. So our, our uh, principal social worker and um, an adult safeguarding lead. And um, it absolutely um, threw me. I was petrified. Um, I'd been warned, my, my, my sister had actually said to me beforehand, um, just be ready, you know, like for the, the interview in a virtual world to sort of um, be really um, different to that kind of like face to face and that might feel really different when you kind of approach it. Um, I kind of thought, yeah, yeah, okay, she might be right. But, um, but yeah, I was um, really quite um, thrown on the day. So I didn't think that I'd been successful. I thought I had um, ruined my opportunities of getting a place on the apprenticeship yet again. Um, so, however, um, I, I was I was selected. So, uh, yeah, and it was and it was very competitive. And there's just some stats there. So it's just sort of showing there's some differences there. Um, so. MPFT, so, th so this year with my cohort, the MPFT requested eight places and there were seven applicants, but staffs, um, you can see there um, from staffs county council, we requested nine places and there were actually 17 interviews. So that's how competitive it was for Staffordshire. And then Stoke requested 10 places with 15 interviews and actually Stoke were the only ones that had their interviews face to face. I think the rest were all virtual. And Cheshire Reese requested eight places um, and had 11 interviews. So I got selected, um, was really chuffed, really excited, couldn't believe it, celebrated. Um, so this was kind of October. So the timeline of this, this was October time, um, 2020. And then the beginning of November 2020, COVID hits me personally. So, um, so yeah, I, I I had COVID, um, was really quite unwell with it and um, ended up having about four weeks off work, but it sort of lingered for, I'd probably say, six, eight, six to eight weeks um, in terms of the headaches and the fatigue. Um, so at that point, I have to be honest, I did think, I can't believe it. I didn't think that I was going to be able to start the apprenticeship because I didn't think at that time, I thought I couldn't concentrate on anything. I wasn't well. Um, and I just thought, I can't believe it. It's this, I've got the opportunity to start the apprenticeship and, and now I'm not going to be able to do it. Um, but um, 
I, I, I got better um, just before Christmas and um, and then during that time, this sort of lead up in, in December, we started to enroll virtually. We started to sign up um, for the course and do this all, like, say, like Megan sort of said, all virtually, all all online, um, you know, having meetings, um, video meetings to show ID, to verify who we are and things. So it was it was all done. Um, and then uh, we were gearing up to actually have our sort of first, I guess, our first session or first meeting of everybody, like our cohort, the university staff, lecturers. Um, we were start. We were expecting to start um, to do that face to face, and then the third lockdown hit in January. Um, and again, I, I remember there was a moment I said to my husband. Um, because I knew sort of um, potentially my children were going to be at home a lot more um, because of not being able to go to school. And I was like, is this the right time to start a degree? Is this the right time to start the apprenticeship? And um, and I remember him saying it absolutely is because actually we're going to really need social workers and um, and it's the right time. It's the right time to do it. So, um, so yeah, so the course starts virtually and we meet all the lecturers and the staff and all of our peers, our fellow cohort, um, all virtually. So, so we start module one. So this is in January. We start module one, which is actually a module called Preparation for Social Work Practice. Um, so the virtual lectures commence um, and it's all about that modules around preparation for academic studies, so referencing um, and relationship based practice and communication. So it's, it's it's got lots of things in that module um, and we sort of started it say sort of all virtually all online we're all sort of trying to get to know one another and um yeah I, i've sort of put a note there there was this irony of the content of the modules all about around relationship-based practice and communication and obviously we're having to do that um online we've not got that face to face so we're learning about particular um models around um non-verbal communication and obviously that is you know that is so hard to to kind of have any of that in the virtual world um so there is that that kind of irony in a way um but we did it we start you know so we've start we started uni we started our apprenticeship lots of support from um staffs uni um and lecturers and um you know that have just kept supported us along the way and we get so much support as well from staffordshire so um in my particular organization we get um apprenticeship supervision which is monthly with the workforce development team and we also have a peer mentor that we can have you know as much access to and regular access to to sort of help guide us and support us on our apprenticeship journeys so they've all been around to sort of support her, support us and then um our fellow apprentices um are just a massive support so we're encouraged to sort of build networks via whatsapp and um and and the you know, so they, they've been brilliant. So they sort of start off slowly, but we've all sort of got to know one another, um, you know, over this time um, to the point where now probably we're sort of sending jokes and sending memes and just keeping one another going and supported, um, you know, because we're all on this journey together. Um, and then at some point we got a care package come through the post um, from uni, which was really lovely. And I don't know whether this was planned, um, but it actually arrived on a Thursday, which is our university day. So we're sort of like sat in our virtual lectures and then on our WhatsApp group, we're kind of all posting and going, my care package has arrived, which was like a lovely package from the university just to sort of say, well done for starting your studies in, you know, in this pandemic during this time we're full of chocolate and sweeties and things like that um, but that was really lovely because we got that say on the Thursday so we we're all getting that through um, and then um, yep so we got together in presentation groups and I think that really worked because we were kind of split off into smaller groups so remembering that we didn't know one another so working in these smaller groups and working on a presentation meant it was a bit of a safer kind of arena I suppose to get to know um, some of your fellow cohort because when I think we were in lectures and just sort of like starting it's a bit like you in the virtual world you don't want to interrupt one another um, it's a bit different from when you're in that sort of face to face um, so being in the smaller smaller groups was good um, yeah so um, one, one of the things to note there 
though, was that it felt like there was so much screen time. And that wasn't just because of uni. That was because, obviously, a lot of um, stuff at work was virtual. Um, you know, like your meetings and, and my sessions with foster carers and even with your, some of the young people were virtual. And then, and then uni was all virtual, even reading books and accessing books online. It didn't have to be. We could access the library, but um, but it was a lot. And, you know, it was a lot of, of um, screen time and then families and friends, you know, <laughs> with our family and friends, Zooms and things. So a lot of screen time. Um, so we had our assessed virtual role play. Um, and and that went OK. I wasn't sure how that was going to be virtually and I wasn't sure whether that was going to go ahead. You know, so we had to do an assessed role play. But yeah, the university got it sorted, got it sussed and we still did it. Um, a virtual role play with um, somebody from the service um, service user carer group and a lecturer. And it was like no different probably to if we'd have been at uni. We were assessed on our um, empathic listening um, and active listening. So, yeah, so meeting face to face, absolutely um, um, amazing. So eventually we got to meet on the 18th of March. We all had our COVID tests um, before we went on campus. Um, and there was like a buzz of excitement in the WhatsApp group. Um, you know, we're all going to get to finally meet one another face to face. We're all going to get to see one another's legs because we've very, we'd only got we've got used to seeing everybody's faces and up um, top of the bodies. Um, so yeah, so and there was this. I remember thinking, it was like the first day of school. What am I going to wear? Um, I need to get my pencil case sorted. What bag am I going to take? Um, and it really felt like this buzz of like the first day of school, and I was like giddy and excited. And it was just an amazing day. We all came together. Um, yep, yeah, we had to do these presentations. I think again, we were thinking that we wouldn't have to do the presentations face to face because we'd been preparing for them virtually. Um, but no, it was it, we were due to do our presentations, so we did our presentations um, and it was just an absolute brilliant day. So just kind of like um, rounding up on on my reflections, I suppose, where am I now? Um, just so proud of us all, really, really proud. There's this sense of like coming together. I think like I, I feel like um, in our cohort, we have this kind of sense of something shared. I feel so proud of us all because it's, uh, you know, it is a really competitive apprenticeship. Um, we, we're juggling it all. We juggle work. We juggle study. Some of us juggle um, other commitments outside as well. You know, um, we have families, um, dependents. So, um, so it's a lot to juggle, and we're doing all of this amid a pandemic. Um, I did wonder whether, you know, whether we would start, whether we would get to start an apprenticeship during the pandemic, but we did. Um, and I just feel so lucky and feel so grateful that we did and that we've got that opportunity to do that because we are doing it. We're we're doing it virtually. Um, so I'm getting ready to submit my first portfolio. I can't believe I'm quite there yet. We've finished module one and um, we're sort of moved, we've, we've started module two already, which is around um, looking at social work theories. Um, and we're sort of moving forward now with this blended approach. So we have some time on campus and have that face to face, which is always just wonderful because you get a different experience in that way. But then we've got um, we still move forward with virtual lectures um, over Teams. And again, it's, you, you get a different experience on that way as well. So I re feel excited about this blended approach um moving forward it's 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 really good but yeah feel really really proud and would it have ever been any different for us this is the way that we started we started in a pandemic we started our journeys on this apprenticeship we will never know if it would ever have been any different this is our journey and this is unique to us and we're smashing it and we're doing it and i'm really proud of us all so um, with that, I'm going to hand over to Eve and she's going to um, tell us a bit more about her experiences. Thank you for listening. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so I'm Eve Pemberton and I work in the Midlands Partnership Foundation Trust in the mental health social care team. Um, so a lot of my role um, is about supporting individuals to access the community, um, which has obviously totally stopped um, during the pandemic. Um, so I wanted to take this opportunity to reflect 
on my experiences primarily within my team um, but also um, as part of the university course as well. Um, so first of all just um, produced this kind of picture diagram to show um, how we've gone from this to this um, during the pandemic. So on the left you can see that we've got people in offices, um, in lecture theatres, um, public transport as well which is quite a big thing as part of my role. We support people to use public transport and also just kind of showing the community networks and how um, during the pandemic these have kind of been weakened. Um, and then it shows how we've gone to work in pre pretty much in isolation, wearing face coverings, um, having lots of teams meetings, that social distancing um, and kind of not being able to go in for face to face lectures, but also meetings and things like that. Um, so if we navigate forward, um, so this is some of the challenges that have been faced. Um, and please feel free, anybody, if you've got anything else that you think is different, add it into the chat because I find it really interesting to see how different people from different teams have adapted and the changes and challenges they've faced. Um, so from my experience, working from home is now the new norm um, within staff in the MPFT. Um, I know for some of the other apprentices, they've pretty much been working in the offices and things. Um, but for us, that's totally been abandoned unless it is absolutely necessary um, and required. Um, so we've also got um, risk assessments. So as part of working from home, um, we've had to have risk assessments to check we've got the suitable equipment to work from home effectively. Um, and also in terms of seeing service users, um, up until recently, um, for me, for seeing service users, it has been like a no-go unless it's a life or death situation. Um, and if we have had to see somebody, we've had to do risk assessments, which um, can be quite daunting for the individual we're seeing and also for us asking them questions relating to kind of those symptoms. Um, technology, um, for us technology has been a massive um, challenge that has been faced. Um, so for me being from a younger generation, I found using technology, it comes natural to me. But for lots of the people um, in our team, it hasn't, they haven't perhaps used technology as much when we were out seeing people in the community. And for them, it's caused a lot of anxiety um, and a lot of stress for not knowing how to use technology um, and not, you know, not having that experience. So that's a massive challenge that has been faced. Um, as well as like virtual team meetings, um, some of the you know virtual team meetings can all not always be effective with having to mute each other, and there can be a lot of talking over each other, um, which isn't necessarily you know per on purpose, but it can feel that way, um, and those kind of relationships can be kind of um, weakened. Um, also, I work out as a work out in the community with libraries and things like that and community groups and all of those have just totally stopped um, for lots of individuals, which has created lots of social isolation and that's been reflected in the increased referrals um, that we have to our team um, because people just haven't been able to have those networks. Um, and as well thing, with things like telephone appointments, they have totally lost all that face to face communication. Um, it can be, you know, just being able to see somebody um, and as well. When we talk to them over the phone, you can't see their facial expressions. We can't see what their home environment's like. Um, so we can't, our assessments haven't been totally reflective um, of an individual situation because we haven't had access to their situation. Um, and just to reiterate more on what Sue said, you know, lectures as well. So online lectures, um, they have been effective, but again, it, they can feel quite daunting if you're not familiar with technology. And as well, you know, you can't see people's faces and it's nice to be able to put faces to names to be able to strengthen um, those relationships. Um, but that was quite negative. But um, as part of my team, um, especially, we have come up with lots of innov innovative ways to overcome these challenges. Um, and I really wanted to use this session to highlight how these challenges have been overcome. 
Um, so as part of our team, we um, at the start of lockdown, so back in March 2020, we were having daily morning catch ups every day just for like 15 minutes with a cup of tea um, just to see how everybody was um, because it's important to recognise that individual members of the team perhaps have family they need to look after and some have also live on their own um, and to not you know you could go days that actually physically without seeing anybody so doing them online um really helped us all just gave us um you know lifted our spirits and we also started doing them of an afternoon as well as a little kind of cut off point if anybody got any questions or anything um because when you think back if you're in an office situation you're constantly talking about things you're constantly just having it you know just constantly engaging and you totally lose all that when you're working from home as I'm sure many of you are familiar with and we also now do weekly lunch meetings and those are still continuing as we're working from home so that's meeting every Friday lunchtime um, and it gives us a bit of time to make sure we have our set lunch breaks, um, which you do lose, um, I find, when working from home because it's easy to just forget about it and just have your lunch while you're doing other work. But this helps to ensure that we're all getting our wellbeing time and the opportunity to discuss um, cases, but also just to discuss family life, anything that's happened, things like that, a bit of light hearted conversation. Um, also, recently, after restrictions have been lifted, we've been doing supervision walks. So um, myself and my supervisor, we go for a walk, um, just a local walk, um, and it helps just have that face to face contact and thinking of those ways that we can go for um do something that's not breaking the restrictions, which walking isn't. And it also helps to get us out and about. Um, and again, as part of the university um, groups in little groups and also as a big university group, we have WhatsApp groups, which helps us. Um, I'm a student rep on the course and that's really helped me to pick up things that people are really struggling with. Um, as face to face, we aren't doing it as much to be able to kind of just understand what people are feeling. Um, it's those WhatsApp groups have been really beneficial. And also um, our team, my team in the MPFT, we've really used social media um, to use our um, kind of team to spread it across um, kind of the community. And we have set up a Facebook page um, during lockdown, which has helped. We've sent that out to individuals for them to kind of keep up to date with the community activities. Um, also as part of the MPFT, they set up a new wellbeing resource service um, that have got loads of wellbeing resources for staff to use. Um, and just a few more um, virtual updates. So COVID-19 updates were coming through every day, updates on PPE to keep everybody in the loop and updated. And then also um, as part of our team, we've also facilitated lots of interactive online sessions for service users such as budgeting workshops and things like that. Um, so I'm now going to pass over to Katie, I think, who's going to discuss a bit more about joining the apprenticeship. Hi, um, I'm Katie. I work as a social work assistant within Stoke-on-Trent um, Children's Social Care. I'm just mindful on time, so I'm going to whiz through with this as uh, quickly as I can do. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about joining the apprenticeship. So I joined the apprenticeship in January 2021. Um, this is my second year at trying for the apprenticeship after being unsu unsuccessful the previous year. Um, I am currently a level four student, so that means I'm in the first year of the university degree. And I currently work as a social work assistant for Stoke-on-Trent City Council, which I've held the role for nine years. I also do out of hours work for the emergency duty team in Stoke um, I mainly work with children and families um, working in a children assessment and case holding team known as CAST. However, I, with working out of hours, I do have some experience of working um, with mental health and adult social care. So why was it social work and what are my experiences? So I apply for the apprenticeship because I want to make a positive change to ensure that everyone can live their lives to their best and full potential. I love working with people and the fact that every day is different um, within my current job. You never go in um, in the morning and it's the same day as what it was the day before. I'm never bored. It keeps me on my toes every single minute of every day. 
And the reason for this is because we're working with people's lives. And as we all know, our, li our own lives change. So our service users and our families' lives are constantly changing. So it, it's very, I need to learn to adapt really um, and put the way my practice in to, to adapt and meet their needs. So within social work, it can be a very challenging environment. But for me, the rewards, even the smallest and um, even the most minute things can have the most positive change. And it gives me a, um, an amazing feeling. So how long have I been looking at doing the social work qualification? Well, when I initially started as a social work assistant within the local authority I am, I've always wanted my aim, my end aim is to be a qualified social worker. However, I haven't been in the financial means to be able to do that myself. And when I initially started with Stoke, we used to second um, people out to do the three year full course and work used to pay for it. However, I think it was about nine months after I started in my position that that stopped. And it wasn't until that the local authority of them come on board and done the apprenticeship um, scheme that I've had that opportunity to be able to to go and progress to be a social worker, hopefully in the end. So one thing really positive from um, what I've seen in regards to when the local authority used to second people is, then people have remained with that local authority. Um, they're now managers or senior social workers. They've been there a, a very long time and the experience and knowledge that they've got is absolutely outstanding. So, why the apprenticeship route and what do I think about good about the on the job learning? So due to being an apprentice social worker, I do feel that I've got the best of both worlds. I can continue with the, my job that I absolutely love and I'm fortunate enough to be able to study one day a week for a professional qualification. I feel apprentices, um, apprenticeships are brilliant, especially the social work apprenticeship, which, which I'm enrolled on. It's allowed me to use and under, expand on my knowledge. For example, I do things in my day to day job, day in, day out. However, it's not until I've started the university course and the apprenticeship that I've finally been able to start to link theories and models into the way that we work and understand the way we practice the way we do. Um, before it's been just very much, it's been told that this is the way we're doing it, but I haven't fully understood why we do it. So it has enabled me to reflect personally on my practice and think about different ways that I can work with families to make me a better worker. So within the cohort that we've currently got at the moment, we've got a mixture of students from different local authorities and health. They work with adults and children, mental health, um, and it's brilliant to sit there in a lecture and listen and learn. We can all learn from each other's experiences. We've all, we've all got a well of knowledge as well. So being able to tap into them is absolutely amazing, um, which I think is one of the, the main um, positives of the apprenticeship for me. Um, so, yeah, we're just moving on to the next slide. So what experiences do I hope to gain from the apprenticeship? So as level four students, things are still very new to me. I'm only in the fifth month of learning, but I'm learning all the time. I've worked with children and families for the last nine years. Um, however, there are many areas that I still need to expand my knowledge on. I've recently shadowed, for example, I've worked for nine years in children, but I've never actually shadowed an adoption panel. So it's the first time during the apprenticeship that I've actually had the opportunity to be able to shadow an, adoptive, an adoption panel and what amazing experience that was. Although I have some very, very basic knowledge of working with adults and mental health, I'm particularly looking forward to level five, where I'll have a placement within an adult setting. And I'm personally hoping that it'll be a mental health setting, um, that because that's something of a keen interest to me. I'm hoping that I'll be able to expand my knowledge and skill set to work with families more effectively. And I'm hoping that this this will have a benefit on the families that I'm working with currently within Stoke-on-Trent. It's also reinforced to me the importance of reflection and how important it is to reflect on my practice um, about how I can improve and how I can work with families better. It's not about, oh, that family just won't work with me. It's 
going back as part of restorative practice and thinking, what am I doing and how can I change so I can work better with that family and not expecting a family to work better with, not expecting a family to change to work with me, but for me to work as the professional to change, um, to work with them. So on a personal note, I feel that the apprenticeship has allowed me to grow. I've been able to take myself out of my comfort zone, exploring new and exciting opportunities, meeting lots of new different people and gaining life experiences. And I'm currently loving this journey and can't wait for it to continue. So what has worked well over the last 12 months? So since March 2020, um, we've all worked completely different. We've been in a COVID pandemic. It's impacted each and every one of us. Um, we've all had to adapt to some of these and they've had, an, and they've had a positive impact on practice. So, for example, some of the positives that it's had on practice is we have um, teenagers, for example, that have not been that are placed all around the country and the relationship with parents and family members hasn't been the best. But what it's enabled them to do is use virtual means. Um, so FaceTime, uh, Microsoft Teams, things like that, to be able to have that direct contact with their families. But not them having to travel miles and miles and miles at a set time at a set venue um, they've been able to freely access that contact with their families and that's with teenagers in particular we've seen some really good um, outcomes of building them relationships back up with family members so we've also seen positive engagements from partners and other professionals so meetings such as child protection conferences they haven't had to travel to them. It's been virtually, so engagement have gone up. Um, we've added technology that we never used 14 months ago. Within local authority, I work with Microsoft Teams and Zooms to help us all remain connected to each other. And obviously we started the apprenticeship course during a national lockdown. Everything was virtual online. And it's not until recently that we've been able to go and see people and interact and we're moving to a blended learning approach. So the support networks that I've currently got. So balancing the apprenticeship and work is challenging at times. However, it's a challenge that I don't think is unmanageable. I work in a very busy team and the nature of the job is not nine to five. It's always on the nights when I think, oh, I'll just complete that bit of reading tonight for university that unfortunately demands my workplace mean that I'm out till very late in the evening and that reading can't be done. So it's about finding time and working with my employer so I can get that reading done for my university course. Um, it's also, it has had an impact on where I work because I've gone from five days to four days. I'm not available on Thursday. So my colleagues have had to pick up additional tasks um, because we are a member of staff down on a Thursday. However, the workplace that I work for have been amazing. They've been so understanding and ensuring that I'm not overwhelmed, that the additional work is distributed fairly. Um, yeah, so I also get support from um, a mentor within the university, uh, sorry, within my workplace. This is somebody that's a manager within my workplace that's known me for a very long time. I find this, um, beneficial because I've got a brilliant professional working relationship with her. She challenged me and pushes me, enables me to reflect and think out of the box. She's also been really supportive in my um, journey in regards to me applying for the apprenticeship as well. So support from the university. I've been really impressed with the support they've received from the university. We are assigned for a tutor um, who's there to ask any questions we have. We also have Megan who's our workplace um, education officer she's been brilliant with helping with things around knowledge skills and behaviors and she also completes reviews and um, to complete that are completed regularly with us um personally i can't thank the university enough for the support they provide me i've gone through high schools i've completed a levels workplace and i've been college i've never had cause of concern in regards to my academic ability however it's not been until i've come to university and started to read the, that the academic literature that I've realised that something wasn't quite right. So I was able to access support for university in the last few months I've been naturally diagnosed with di uh, dyslexia. So as part of that I've been even more support's been added for me. Um, I've got a study skills coach additional to the sport that's already on offer and I, I, it's been amazing help and support for me. 
Um, as it's already been mentioned before from other, my other students on the, um, the course, we've got support from each other. We've set up WhatsApp groups, but we've also been able to get help and support from the level five students. Um, so they've been offered help us as much as we want. Um, and that's been really lovely um, to know that they've gone through this journey last year and now we're going through it as well. So overall, I, I'm just going to end it off with saying I feel so fortunate to been given this amazing opportunity. I'm loving each and every bit of it so far. A day at university is on a Thursday and once Thursday lecture is finished, I'm counting down the days until my le next lecture the following Thursday. Right, I'll pass you over to Callie um, now for her to continue with her bit. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Kelly. Uh, I'm a personal advisor on a through care team uh, at Staffordshire County Council. Um, our team's a little bit different to the other through care teams in that we deal predominantly, well, well only with unaccompanied asylum seeking children. Um, so young people that have entered the country, usually illegally and um, by uh, by boats or uh, lorries usually into the country um, and yeah so it, it does it's a little bit different to the kind of general three care teams that we also have at Staffordshire. Um, so my plan was just to give um, a, an overview on the impact of mental health uh, from my perspective as an apprentice uh, student social worker um, starting on this journey obviously particularly with Covid as well. Um, so the the World Health Organisation describe mental health as a state of well-being in which an individual realises his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Mental health is fundamental to our collective and individual ability as humans to think, emote, interact with each other, earn a living and enjoy life. With the arrival of COVID, I think it's safe to say that every aspect of our day to day lives and well-being were impacted upon. Um, so for me personally, taking on this degree uh, left me kind of questioning my own abilities as to whether I could cope uh, with the actual demands of the course, holding down a full time job, homeschooling um, and dealing with, I suppose, my own worries about the pandemic and my, my family and how to keep them safe. Um, studying at a degree level is totally new to me and I haven't written assignment since college so that was something I was particularly worried about and I was kind of letting it consume me a little bit prior to the course starting. Um, I think as the others have, have already touched on that the, the actual process of applying for the apprenticeship was really different to what we were we were expecting um, with, with Covid and the national lockdowns um, so what was going to be a kind of face-to-face assessment day I believe with with all the other potential candidates changed to obviously very virtual um, the interview and written assessments were all carried out on teams um, and I was I was quite anx anxious anyway about the the interview process and worried that obviously we might have issues with technology on the day and, and kind of uh, cause additional stress um, but actually on reflection I think being at home it, it for me personally made me feel quite a bit more relaxed um, and it gave me time to it gave me extra time that uh, where I wasn't spent traveling to kind of prepare beforehand and run through some case studies that I was hoping to to refer to during the interview. Um, so once the initial stages were completed and I found out that I was successful, I was I was obviously really happy. I was completely surprised that I'd got through. Um, but I suppose my thoughts and anxieties turned to. Or what what would it what's it all going to be about what how you know how how am I going to fit, fit everything in the remote learning uh, not knowing anybody and how I'd be able to build up rapport with the lecturers and fellow apprentices um, so kind of I think it was the first kind of eight to nine weeks everything was held remotely on teams and and as the others have said cameras were off um, other than the lecturer and not having met anyone putting your hand up to kind of ask a question in a virtual room was quite daunting as the um, ability to interact as we normally would had obviously been taken away. Um, we soon kind of got speaking and setting up WhatsApp groups and attending group supervisions and people got chatting outside of lectures and I think I very quickly felt part of something 
um, and my initial fears and anxiety started to subside somewhat. Um, it surprised me how quickly actually a, a, like a group of people bonded having only have met virtually but all having this one thing in common by starting on this journey together. Um, the support to us as apprentices has been incredible by both the university and my employer. Uh, they have a genuine invested interest in wanting us to succeed on the course, but they also offer a huge amount of support for our overall well-being. They're always checking in on us. They, you know, they 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 want us to to kind of know that they, we can go to them whenever we need to. Um, that there's lots of different avenues for us to access support, uh, whether that's your personal tutor. Um, or, or work. Um, we have our own kind of uh, mentors as well as I know somebody else has touched on and, and that has really helped manage my personal fears and anxieties. In terms of my day job, um, as I said earlier, I'm a personal advisor on a through care team uh, with unaccompanied asylum seeking young people, so English is their second language. Face-to-face -face visits are always of huge importance as body language, non-verbal cues help with communication immensely with the cohort of young people I work with. Um, our local authority, Staffordshire, we um, kind of took the stance of visits would all now be completed remotely unless um, it, it was actually essential for us to go out and visit face-to-face. Um, however, the frequency of contact that I had with my young people did change dramatically. Um, as a personal advisor, we're usually expected to visit a young person at least every eight weeks. Uh, but due to COVID, this changed to every two weeks to ensure that regular contact was being made and uh, given the challenges COVID placed upon everyone, but particularly on care leavers who are obviously already extremely vulnerable young people anyway. A general PA caseload is around 25 young people. Um, so the increased visits actually equated to additional 75 visits being conducted within each eight week period. And this did place a huge amount of stress on us as workers um, to ensure that this was obviously written up in time scale um, and any action support needs that came from that visit had been met. Um, in addition to this, the Department for Education were also requesting data that needed to be, called, be recorded weekly. And that was to establish the type of contact that we were having with our care leavers. Um, and if we were unable to maintain this level of contact, we had to give a reason as to why that was. Uh, personally, having gone from working in a really busy office with lots of peer support available from colleagues, we were obviously all now isolated at home, worried about the pandemic, worried about the health of our loved ones. A real concern about the isolation um, that our young people are facing increased work demands, homeschooling my own two children, and then the added addition of this degree to get to grips with. Um, I think it was safe to say that my own well-being and ability to cope with normal life stresses were without doubt tested to the, the absolute limit, really. I learned throughout this period that the peer support from fellow colleagues within my team had been kind of, I suppose, taken for granted before those five minute breaks to kind of grab a coffee together where we would discuss maybe a difficult case or obtain different perspectives were really missed. And the value of this and how it impacts my practice really remains something I'm want, really keen to kind of return to once restrictions have lifted. To fill the gap um, of this, we kind of created a buddy system which involved teaming up with a, another colleague virtually and ensuring that we checked in with each other daily uh, we scheduled mini team meetings um, and we did some kind of solution focused circles as well to discuss any young people that were maybe having a particularly difficult time. The impact on mental health due to COVID is something that's obviously still being researched at the moment. And whilst we don't know the full extent of this research, um, research suggests that the pandemic will affect everyone's mental well-being, but particularly vulnerable groups such as children. Um, I, I did a little bit of research around this and, um, and took a, an extract from Homes at Tell 2020 that states vulnerable groups include those with pre-existing mental or physical health issues, recovered individuals and those who become mentally unwell in response to anxiety and loneliness surrounding the pandemic. Therefore, loss of access to mental health support alongside loss of positive activities might increase vulnerability during COVID-19. 
Um, another study that was carried out by the National Child Development compared the mental health of care experience young people to other adults, and it showed an increase of emotional and behavioural problems, psychiatric disorders, as well as a higher risk of depression. Other studies um, found that a staggering 48% of care experienced young people had a long term mental illness. So with the addition of COVID and the worries and fears that the pandemic has brought with it, we, we really do believe that the mental health of our care experienced young people will have been compromised further. With care experienced adults more likely to live alone, the impact of the lockdown has been far reaching with social, iso social isolation being at the core. And in addition to this, provisions that were once able to access, such as counselling or therapeutic services, have, have all now been moved virtually. Digital poverty is a huge issue for our young people, and this has created further barriers really to accessing provisions. Um, and, and in some circumstances, has meant that services have actually been closed down to young people because it, 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 it appears that they're, they're not engaging. As I mentioned earlier, I currently work with the young people who have fled war-torn countries from all over the world and who have endured very traumatic journeys to the UK to seek safety. Modern day slavery and trafficking are obviously um, linked within this journey and the impact of this on young people's mental health can be devastating, with post-traumatic stress disorder being a common factor. And during this pandemic, I have witnessed a real concerning decline really in the emotional well-being of the young people that I work with. Um, and obviously, the lack of engagement really with peers and now virtual visits being completed by those that support them. And these young people have entered the country as children on their own, their families being thousands of miles away and due to COVID have now been separated from their friends who they really do see as family here in the UK now. However, I suppose although many of us will have faced challenges and periods of time where we feel our well-being has been compromised throughout the pandemic, for others, I feel that there has been some real positives to take from it. The different ways in which we have learned to continue to communicate with one another the time saved travelling from one place to another for visits, less rushing around and kind of trying to be in two places at once and more opportunities to enjoy family time will all have had pod positive impacts on our mental health. And I just wanted to conclude my section with this picture. I think these emojis sum up some of the emotions I know I have felt particularly throughout the last 12 months. And I like how it states that these feelings are all completely normal. Whilst the, whilst the pandemic has had a huge impact on people's mental health for a variety of reasons, I think we can all take some positives from this time we were given to just slow down our pace. And hopefully we can take some of the positive outcomes and, and, and new things we've learned throughout this time and continue to move forward with them in the future. So thanks for listening and thanks for your time. Thanks everyone. Um, that's the end of our session. I know we've run over a little bit, um, but I've put my email in the chat um, just in case anyone has got any questions um, and I'll pass back to the teaching partnership. Thank you, Megan, um, and thank you to the, the people that have um, given their, their reflections as well. It was really, really interesting. Um, listening to what you've got to say um, and I'm sure that people have found it really interesting. I can see from comments in the chat so far that people seem to have found it really useful so thank you very much for your time and putting that together um, and yeah if you could please give some feedback in the, using the um, survey monkey link that would be great because it'd be really helpful for the teaching partnership to um, understand how useful it's been and obviously I'm planning future CPD events as well and in terms of later this week there are, are more sessions being put on as well throughout the week until Thursday as part of practice week so please do have a look to see if there's any other sessions that you'd be interested in joining as well. Thank you very much. Excuse me is this the last one of the series for today? Uh, Hello. No, there's another session just starting now um, and there's a session this afternoon. Is, it, is that the one at one o'clock? Yeah, the one at one o'clock, the participation research. Yeah, I was wondering because 